continue with Jonah, as promised last week. And I think Shelby must have been looking at my notes, because she was talking about attitude, and so is Jonah. Jonah struggled with some attitude issues. Just a little review. Jonah lived in Israel, the northern kingdom, so not anywhere near Jerusalem because they had separated and they were at war with each other. And it was roughly 760 years before Jesus came. And he was this prophet of God whom God told to go and preach to Nineveh. And being a prophet of God, he said, sure, whatever you say. Well, maybe not. What God says to him is, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. And I'm guessing Jonah, yeah, yeah, no argument from me there. They're a wicked people. But he didn't like the the idea of preaching to them. We're not told why at this point. But like I said last time, this is kind of like a movie where you get these flashbacks and then you go forward again. Well, later on we kind of figure out why he didn't want to go. My approach with the whole book of Jonah for this is that Jonah had three problems. And the first problem was last week, the problem of running away from God. Today, the problem of knowing God too well, which sounds kind of weird. And the third one, the problem of God's grace. It also sounds weird. The problem of knowing God too well. We all probably agree that trying to run away from God, well, that's a problem. Why did he even try? He was a prophet of God. He knew better. He knew that God was the God of the whole world. He says in verse 9 of the first chapter, when they've got this big storm and the sailors grab him and wake him up and tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? What, from what people are you? And he answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the land. So he knew better. David had written a psalm many years earlier, and maybe he was familiar with it, maybe he wasn't, I don't know. I don't know how well things were passed around in those days, but I would assume that he knew Psalm 139, just part of it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me, etc. and so forth. You can't run away from God. So why did he try? Crazy. Have you ever pretended... that God couldn't see what you were doing. (laughs) In honesty, we all have. Or have you ever pretended God couldn't hear what you're thinking? Yes, we do. So Jonah tried to get away from God because it was his attitude. Let's look at some of the things that Jonah experienced and what he said. So chapter 2. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. By now Jonah has been tossed over the side. The fish has come to swallow him. The storm has died down. The sailors up on the ship have offered sacrifices to God and made vows to God. And then in verse 2, from inside the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. 
He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help and you listened to my cry. What did he say? Doesn't say that. Doesn't say what he said. I just, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. What did he call? I don't know. From the depths of the grave, I called for help. Just help? Is that it? And you listen to my cry. We're not told what he said because we don't need to know. Have you ever just cried out to God? You've got something in here and it's just, it's so big and it has no handles. You see no way of dealing with it. And you just cry out to God. You don't always need to have words. Romans chapter 8 verse 26, Paul says, In the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. Sometimes you don't have to have words. Verse 3, You hurled me into the depths, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. Your waves and breakers swept over me. He's very descriptive in his his writing. I said, I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Now, where did he get that idea? There's some kind of a confidence and a trust in God. I have been banished from your sight, yet I will look again toward your holy temple. Was he saying, okay, once I'm dead and I'm in heaven, I'm going to see your temple? Or was he, I don't know. We can spin that any way we like. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. Gross. To the depths of the mountains I sank down, and the earth beneath barred me in forever. Just Jonah describing his situation. Verse 8. No, verse 7. But you brought my life up from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord. And my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. What did he pray? We're not told. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs, but I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. What did he vow? Don't know. We can assume all kinds of things. And the commentators certainly do make assumptions. But making an assumption about Scripture is a dangerous thing. Far too many heresies have been spun out because somebody assumed this is actually what what was really meant here. We don't see Jonah explicitly repenting to God. Nowhere in here does he say, I repented. I apologized. Nowhere does he say, God, if you get me out of this, I will go back, I will go to Nineveh and I'll do what you said. We don't read that. He does refer to some kind of a vow. I don't know what that is. We don't see him saying sorry for running away or if you get me out of this, I'll do better next time. Some of you may remember a guy by the name of Orville Andrews. He used to live in Prince Albert in his retirement years, but for somebody like Orville, there is no such thing as retirement until his funeral. Um, Orville and his wife spent many years in northern Manitoba as a missionary to, to people in that, those communities. Orville told me one time that there was a guy he knew up there who had built a snow plane, homemade snow plane. You get a couple of big skis, maybe four of them, You get a fairly good-sized motor from some old car that's wrecked. You get an airplane propeller and strap it on the back of that motor. And somehow you put it all together and then you 
put a seat up in front of that motor and propeller and you have something to turn the front skis homemade. And it's kind of awkward to reach back there for the throttle so you get a wire that comes over the front and you kind of hold it right here to speed up and slow down. This guy had been flying across some lake in northern Manitoba, and as happens with big lakes, sometimes the ice separates. And he sees this huge open water in front of him. And he tries to turn, and it's not turning. And the boat, or the boat, the plane, skids sideways into the water, and down he goes. And he tries to get off, but this throttle cable is hooked into his jacket. And he's going down, and he prays, Lord, if you get me out of this, I'll become a Christian. And God did. And he stuck to it. We don't see anything like that here with Jonah. God, you get me out of this and I'll do better next time. I said last week that chapter 2 was maybe more of a psalm than a prayer. A prayer I would like to... I think of a prayer as, okay, God, I'm asking for this, and God, if you do this, I'll promise. More specifics. This is more an outpouring of emotion. Psalm 40, I believe it is. Psalm 40, verses 1 to 4. The psalmist says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Same thing. It's an outpouring of emotion. It's not a lot of detail. It's more an expression of something inside. And I think that's what chapter 2 in Jonah is. It's an outpouring of his heart. But nothing in there says he knows God too well. He has trust in God. I will, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. With a song of thanksgiving I will sacrifice to you. Salvation comes from... He knows God well. And my title is... The problem is knowing God too well. Okay, carry on. Chapter 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Think about that. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Can God use somebody who has failed? How many of us have failed? Can God renew a commission for somebody like Jonah, who, no way, I'm not doing that, God, I'm going the other way. Why? Why bother with this washed out prophet. Couldn't he find another prophet? Is there not another prophet in Israel to send to Nineveh? Absolutely there would be. So why bother with Jonah? I think it speaks of God's love, not just for the people of Nineveh, but also for Jonah specifically. He cared about Jonah. He didn't want Jonah to go through the rest of his life. Yeah, okay, the fish chucked him up, but go through the rest of his life feeling like a failure, or having made it all the way to Tarshish, and do what? Wander around there as this failed prophet from Israel. God cared too much about Jonah as well as he cared too much about the people of Nineveh. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, 
not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So Jonah hears God call a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Verse 3. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. And again, a lot of commentators, what does a visit required three days mean? Well, one guy says, it means that from the place where Jonah got up chucked by the fish, landed on the shore, from there it took him three days to get to Nineveh. A visit required three days. Some say it just took three days to walk from one end to the other. Or did it take three days to walk around the city? Or did it take three days to see all the important sites in the city, a guided tour for a tourist? That would have been three. Again, we don't know. Most commonly, the way it's translated, you look at all the different translations, it looks like it took three days to walk through. Verse 4, on the first day Jonah started into the city, he proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. And one commentator says, so what does overturn mean? Because, you know, later on we see the city was, you know, they had a great revival, so actually it was right, they were overturned. I don't think that's what Jonah had in mind. I don't think that's what God had in mind when he started this drama. I think it was 40 more days and the city will be destroyed, overturned as in destroyed. Verse 5. The Ninevites believed God. It doesn't say they believed Jonah. It's better this way anyway. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust, a symbol of repentance in that culture. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decrees of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink. Man, he sure wrecked the economy for a couple of days there, didn't he? Uh, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone, call, let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. He certainly thought overturn meant destroyed. Greatest revival in history, it's been called. Not a revival of people who wanted a closer relationship with God. A revival of people who were terrified of what God might do. Apparently it works that way too. This whole decree by the king, this proclaiming this fast, let not... Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, etc. Complete citywide repentance. Maybe God will turn from his anger. Can a king prompt revival? In our culture, that sounds crazy. Nobody's going to tell me what to think or whom to worship. Certainly not Prime Minister Trudeau. <laughs> but in other cultures, people sometimes think differently. I read a story years ago of a missionary who came into a village in Africa, told him who he was, what he was, why he was there, and he started teaching found this tree kind of in the center of the village and in the shade of that tree he would teach. He didn't start with Jesus and the cross and the blood of Christ and all that. He started telling them about a God who created everything in Genesis. And he started, went through Genesis, the creation, and the evil that people had, and the flood, 
and on Abraham and Isaac and God's call to them and the prophets and all these different parts and it took him months and finally he gets to the point where people would not repent for any other reason and then finally God sent his son and then all of the things that happened with Jesus and then they put him on the cross and the whole village was absolutely in shock. And they said, what do we do? And he carried on with his teaching and explained about salvation. And the chief said, well, then we all need to be followers of Jesus. And they all were. In our culture, that sounds crazy. But not every culture thinks like ours. The whole village did convert to Christianity. But then they'd all heard this message over months. So then, God has renewed his call to Jonah. And Jonah has done what God wanted him to do. Verse 10, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. And we would cheer, wouldn't we? It's a great revival. It's amazing. They won't get destroyed after all. And here's where the problem shows up for Jonah, the problem of knowing God too well. But Jonah, chapter 4, verse 1, was greatly displeased and became angry. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said? Remember the flashbacks? At the beginning when God says, go to the great city of of Nineveh and preach against it, Jonah turned and ran. Well, here he says, is this not what what I said when I was still at home? That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. This is the prophet of God. A God who relents from sending calamity. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah, right at the beginning, knew God too well for what he wanted to have happen. We see Jonah at his finest here, or his worst, depending on how you want to look at it. Jonah knew God. But Jonah's own desires and own wishes were contrary to what God wanted. Is this not what I said when I was still at home? I knew you would do this. Makes me angry. You keep forgiving people when they repent. (sighs) Many years earlier, there was a prophet, Elijah, who also wanted to die. In 1 Kings chapter 19, he had this great experience of victory on Mount Carmel with the prophets of Baal. And the fire came down from heaven and all these things happened and they slaughtered the prophets. And there was this great revival. And then Jezebel says before the sun sets or however that one goes, I'm going to kill Elijah. And Elijah runs. And he runs and he runs and he runs. In chapter 19, verse 4, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. It's a little different. He was tired. He was exhausted. He felt defeated and alone even though he had just seen this dramatic display of God's power. So his is more despair. Jonah was just flat out angry. Angry at God, because God is gracious. He hated the Assyrians. I knew you would do this. But... It isn't really knowing God well that's the problem. It's Jonah's attitude that's the problem. There were others who knew God well in the Old Testament. Abraham, 
knew God well, well enough to bargain with him for the city of Sodom. Jacob knew God well, well enough to have a wrestling match with him at night. Moses was a terrific event in Moses' life. In Numbers chapter 14, if I can find my way there. In Numbers chapter 14, the Israelites have come a few months through the desert and they come to the land of Canaan that God said he would give them. And they send their spies in and the spies say, no, it's too big, it's too, those people are too strong, we can't do this. Chapter 14, verse 11, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people treat me with contempt? In other words, not trusting him. How long will they refuse to believe in me in spite of all the miraculous signs I have performed among them? I will strike them down with a plague and destroy them and I will make you, that is Moses, into a nation greater and stronger than they. That's pretty heady stuff for Moses. And Moses said to the Lord, and it's an incredible conversation, confrontation, something between Moses and God. Moses said to the Lord, then the Egyptians will hear about it. By your power, you brought these people up from among them, and they will tell the inhabitants of this land about it. They have already heard that you, O Lord, are with these people, and that you, O Lord, have been seen face to face, that your cloud stays over them, and that you go before them in a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. If you put these people to death all at one time, the nations who have heard this report about you will say, the Lord is not able to bring these people into the land he promised them on oath, so he slaughtered them in the desert. And he goes on and on. God, think about your own reputation if you do this. There's some of these people in Scripture, they have this relationship with God and they have these conversations that, you know, if you were to do that with somebody who's way in authority over you, it would be a pretty tough thing. Moses says, God... You know, you're slow to anger, Moses is reminding God. You forgive people. Don't do this. Think of your own reputation. And God says, okay, yeah, you're right. Or something like that. <laughs> Jonah knew God well. I think Moses knew God even better. The difference is the attitude. God gave Jonah a second chance, and Jonah obeyed, but not with the right attitude. He still wanted to go and watch this city be destroyed. So how's your attitude to God? How's your attitude to the people around you? Jonah probably figured my attitude to God is good, but those Ninevites... They can rot in hell. How's your attitude to God? And how's your attitude to the people around you? The Bible shows us so many different kinds of people. The faithful, the faithless, the ones who sin and repent, the ones who sin and don't repent the gentle, the harsh, and so many others. And sometimes we see ourselves in this one, and sometimes we see ourselves in that one. Can you see yourself in Jonah and in his attitude? I have to admit far too often, my attitude is not that much better than Jonah's. How well do you know God? Do you know him well enough? Do you know him too well for the attitude you're harboring? Most of us, if we're honest, we would have to recognize we are the kind of people who know one part of God and assume that's all there is to know. 
But there's almost always more to know because God is infinite and amazing and amazingly gracious. So next Sunday we'll continue with Jonah and his problem with grace. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the, uh, the story of Jonah and everything that it's included in it and for giving us the privilege to scratch a few of the places in there. As we consider our own attitudes towards each other and towards the world around us, we pray that you would use your word to teach us and to guide us. And thank you, God, for your presence here. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank <laughs> you.